Welcome to our latest Wondering Walks of Wonder Walking Tour. Today we're headed to Omaha, Nebraska. Along this tour we'll learn about some of the famous people as well as buildings that are in the downtown area of Omaha. The history of Omaha dates back quite a ways. In fact, various Native American tribes inhabited the land that became Omaha since around the 17th century, including the Omaha and Ponca tribes. These were people who originated in the lower Ohio River Valley and migrated west by the early 17th century. Other tribes included the Pawnee, Oto, Missouri, and Iowa. The word Omaha itself means upstream people or people against the current. In 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition passed by the riverbanks where Omaha would later be established. From July 30th to August 3rd, 1804, members of the expedition, including Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, met with Odo and Missouri tribal leaders at the Council Bluff, about 20 miles north of present-day Omaha. South of that area, several American fur trading outposts were built in the following years, including Fort Lisa in 1812, Fort Atkinson in 1819, and Fontenelle's Post in 1823 in what would become Bellevue. Fierce competition among the fur traders eventually let, led to John Jacob Astor creating the monopoly of the American Fur Company. In 1846, the Mormons established a temporary settlement called Cutler's Park in the area, which laid the foundation for future development. Through 26 separate treaties with the United States federal government, Native American tribes in Nebraska, in Nebraska gradually ceded the lands that now make up the state. The treaty involving the Omaha area occurred in 1854 when the Omaha tribe ceded most of east central Nebraska. Logan Fontenelle, an interpreter for the Omaha and a signatory to the 1854 treaty, played an essential role in these proceedings. The first building that we see here on our tour is the First National Bank Building. With $17 billion in managed assets, the First National Bank Omaha is considered the country's largest private bank. From the day it opened its doors in 1857 as the Coons Brothers Bank, trading mostly in gold dust and buffalo hides, the banking house has moved into increasingly more spacious digs. This one was constructed in 1917. Right across the street from the First National Bank building is the Securities Building. The Rose Realty Company erected this property as a speculative venture in 1916. As we head up Farnham Street, we'll see on our left hand side the Farnham Building. It's that red brick building with the buff color uh, work down on the bottom two floors. George B. Prince learned his architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Tours of Europe. He came to Omaha in 1891 as Chief's Draftsman for the town's premier 19th century architect, Thomas R. Kimball. Prince hung out his own shingle in 1909 and embarked on a long and versatile design career in Omaha. One of the most beautiful and historic bank buildings in the downtown area of Omaha is right here on our right, and that is the Omaha National Bank. Frederick Elmer Hill of the legendary New York architecture firm McKim, Mead & White came to the Midwest in 1885 to construct identical office towers for New York Life Insurance in Omaha and Kansas City, giving each town its very first skyscraper. He'll use brownstone on the lower stories and bricks the rest of the way up for this Italian Renaissance revival style. The building was acquired in 1906 by the Omaha National Bank that was formed in 1857 by Herman and Augustus Kuntz, brothers from Omaha from their early for uh, Omaha in their early 20s. The building that we see here today, Omaha National Bank, is the oldest bank west of the Mississippi River. The tall, really tall building that we see here in front of us is the Woodman Tower. Joseph Cullen Root, 
founded the modern woodmen of America in Lyons, Iowa in 1883 to, quote, clear away problems of financial security for its members. Root couldn't hack his way through the tangled overgrowth of the modern woodmen and split for Omaha in 1890 to found the woodmen of the world. Today, there are some 800,000 woodmen in the United States. In the beginning, as part of their life insurance benefits, members received a distinctive tombstone carved in the shape of a tree stump. Many of those you can see today in some of the older cemeteries. In 1912, their 19-story tower at 14th and Farnham was the tallest building between Chicago and San Francisco. The current 478-foot tower, which rose on the rubble of Omaha's 76-year-old City Hall, was completed in 1969. We're now taking a look at the Douglas County Courthouse. This particular site has been used for the county law since 1879 when a jail was erected on the southwest corner of this block. It was followed in 1885 by the second Douglas County House of Justice, although that justice did not always come swift for Omahans. On October 18, 1891, John Coe, a black laborer, was being tried for the assault of a five-year-old girl. When word erroneously spread that the girl had died, a crowd of as many as a thousand men overwhelmed police at the courthouse and hauled Coe from his jail. By the time he was hung from a streetcar wire at 17th and Harney Streets, Coe was probably already dead from the lynch mob. The courthouse that we see today uh, has served the county for well over a hundred years. It suffered damage at the hands of that lynch mob in a riot in 1919 that resulted in the death of a black worker named Will Brown. Two deaths in the mob and the hanging of Mayor Edward Parson Smith, who confronted the mob saying that if they needed to hang someone, hang him. Smith was cut down by, poli by police and lingered near death in Ford Hospital for several days before recovering. When his term ended the next year, he left politics. On our left here is the Omaha City Hall building, which is a more modern building. But in 1890, Omaha invested $550,000 in a grand new Victorian pile of a city hall that was awash in towers and steep roofs and gargoyles. I have a picture here of what that old city hall building used to look like. It was composed of red sandstone above a granite base, and it had a kind of a medieval vibe, which inspired the nickname the Old Red Castle. The soft sandstone, though, was crumbling by the 1960s, and it was sold to the woodmen of the, the woodmen of the woodmen of the world who tore it down for their new tower, while the government moved into this more modern office tower. Across the street from us is the Union State Bank Building, or also known as the Service Life Building. John Lattenser was born in Liechtenstein, Germany in 1859. He was the son and grandson of architects. He trained in Germany before sailing to America and eventually settled in Omaha in 1885. He settled into a long career as one of the town's most prolific architects, designing buildings from the Victorian age all the way into the Art Deco era of the 1930s. Here he added this early expression of an Art Deco building that was completed in 1927. The large brick building that we see here on our left is the Bankers Reserve Life Company building, or also known as the Farm Credit Building. 
This beefy office building was constructed in two phases, 10 years apart, that are wed in, wedded into a seamless composition by architect Frederick A. Henninger. The east half of the building was completed in 1923, and the west half of the building was added in 1933 for Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal creation, the Farm Credit Association. Passages on each floor linked the sections and enabled all farm credit functions to operate under one roof for the very first time. Across the street from the farm credit building is the Northwestern Bell Telephone Tower building. Northwestern Bell was incorporated in 1896 to handle telephone service in Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. The area had enjoyed rudimentary telephone service since around 1878, just two years after Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated the first telephone with small exchanges in Deadwood, South Dakota and Minneapolis. Headquartered here in Omaha, Northwestern Bell erected this 15-story tower in 1918 and added additional heights to the building in several years after that, making it one of the tallest buildings at time. It was home to the Northwestern Bell headquarters until 1991 when U.S. West merged its three Bell operating companies. The large skyscraper that we see in front of us was constructed in 2002 and is known as the One First National Center. It stands at 634 feet tall and is not only the tallest building in Omaha, but also the tallest in the entire state of Nebraska. We're now walking past the Ruska Federal Courthouse. This building, this courthouse, is named after Roman L. Ruska, a former U.S. Senator from Nebraska who served from 1954 to 1976. This is a newer building that was completed and dedicated on October 28, 2000. The courthouse uh, provides facilities for federal court operations here in the Omaha area, and it replaced several older outdated buildings. Inside are district courts, bankruptcy courts, and other federal courts, as well as offices for judges, clerks, and court personnel. The 19th century saw significant growth in Omaha, mainly due to the Union Pacific Railroad constructing the first railroad bridge across from Council Bluff, Iowa, not too far away from here. The building of the railroads made the loss of the capital to Lincoln when, the, when Nebraska became a state just a mere speed bump in Omaha's development. A population of about 16,000 in 1870 became 140,000 just 20 years later. The first meatpacking plant opened in the 1870s, and in 1883, a feeding station for stock was transferred to the Union Stockyards that attracted four of the country's five top meatpackers as Omaha became America's third largest livestock market. Lead from Colorado arrived on the railroads for processing in one of the world's largest smelters, and wheat and corn from the richest farmlands on the planet piled up in the city's grain elevators and warehouses that lined the Missouri River. Nationwide financial turmoil, grasshoppers, and drought all tested the town in the 1890s, but Omaha was firmly established as a dominant industrial city of the Upper Plains by the late 1890s.
In 1898, Omaha formally announced its emergence from a dusty frontier town by hosting a World's Fair named the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition. During its four-month run, over 2.6 million people, including President William McKinley, arrived in Omaha to marvel at 4,000 exhibits. A century later, Omaha had successfully executed the tricky transition from industrial hub to a diversified economy with many Fortune 500 companies headquartered in town. We're now looking at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. Nebraska's first Episcopal parish was established here in 1856 and served as the base for many Episcopal missions across the West. This Gothic Revival church dates back to 1883 and is composed of rock-faced Illinois bluestone. Took about three years to complete Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. Another historic church in downtown Omaha is St. Mary Magdalene Church. Originally, a simple wooden structure that was just about 24 feet by 40 feet occupied this space and was built by Omaha Catholics in 1856, becoming the first church in the Nebraska Territory. Within a decade, St. Mary's Church had grown into four parishes, including St. Magdalene and St. Philomena in Omaha. By 1900, there were more than 70 parishes in the Archdiocese of Omaha. This Romanesque and Gothic-style St. Mary Magdalene Church was dedicated in 1903. The large stone building that we see on the rise up here on our right is Central High School. When Nebraska Territory was formed in 1854, Omaha was designated as, territorial co uh, as a territory capital. Atop this rise with views of the entire settlement down to the Mississippi River, the Capitol building was originally constructed and remained here until 1867 when Lincoln wrested the capital away from Omaha. Although this grand neoclassical structure looks like a state house, it's actually a high school. Architect John Latzenzer, Latzenzer envisioned it to be even grander. His plans for Central High called for a 200-foot central tower that was not built due to lack of funds. The building was completed in 1912 and still in use 100 years later as the oldest active high school building in the city. Notable alumni of the school include two Nobel Prize recipients and uh, actor Henry Fonda, football great Gail Sayers, and the chairman of Wall Street Wizard Warren Buffett, who still lives in Omaha to this day. In 1912, the members of the Omaha Valley of Scottish Rite broke ground for this new temple that we see across the street from us. Architect John Latinser, who brought other neoclassical monuments to the Omaha streetscape, such as the Douglas County Courthouse, as well as Central High School that we saw earlier, delivered yet another temple for the Masons. The building covers about 47,000 square feet on four floors and open to members in the fall of 1914.
Ahead of us on our right is the old Riviera Theater, which is now the Rose Blumpkin Performing Arts Center. John Eberson, who was a nationally celebrated theater architect in the 1920s, known for what was called an atmospheric movie house and tra that would transport patrons to exotic journeys, constructed the Riviera Theater in 1926 with this very beautiful Moorish-style design. He crafted the inside to resemble a Mediterranean night with a star-sprinkled sky. Presenting elaborate live performances as well as movies, the Riviera Theater, and later known as the Paramount Theater, and still later as the Astro, was one of the premier stages in the Midwest. It was one of the lucky ones that survived some of the tearing down of buildings in Omaha in the 1980s and was purchased by Rose Blumpkin, who restored it to its original glory. Walking down Farnham Street here, we see the Sanford Hotel. John Lattinser, who also designed many of the other buildings that we've seen, constructed this seven-story seven story building in 1916. It was, it, the price tag was about $140,000 when it was completed the next year. This was the second hotel developed by money man Harold Gifford in a town that boasted over 117 hotels, according to the city directory that year. Gifford was an internationally renowned leader in eye surgery and helped found Methodist Hospital and the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. The Sanford Hotel was operated, to, was operated by Harley Condon, who eventually purchased it and changed the name to the Condon Hotel. It was one of the last high-rise hotels in downtown Omaha before being converted to apartments. This beautiful building we see in front of us is the Omaha Public Library building. The very first books that were lent on a subscription basis in Omaha in 1857 created by the Omaha Library Association. That enterprise closed its doors after three years, but in 1877, the Omaha City Council levied a tax to fund a public library that would operate originally from a room in the Simpson Carriage Factory. This is the first dedicated library building in Omaha and was constructed in 1894 and on land donated by Byron Reed. Reed, who came to Omaha in 1855 and opened the first real estate office in the Nebraska Territory, was considered one of the greatest collectors of the 19th century. He donated his rare books, manuscripts, as well as a coin collection believed to be the most complete ever assembled to the city of Omaha after its death in 1891. Thomas Kimball designed that, this, that beautiful three-story structure that we saw, and it served Omaha library patrons until 1977.
the building that we see on our left with the kind of buff color on the bottom as well as the top of the building was completed in 1911 and again built by John Latinser who used the Chicago style type of architecture. When a diagonal thoroughfare is inserted into an orderly street grid, this often results in an occasional triangular lot that often becomes a park because of its awkward footprint for construction, but not always. The most famous diagonal street in America is Broadway in New York City where the original Flatiron building was constructed in 1902. It influenced similar triangular construction projects across the country. Architect George B. Prince tackled this lot in 1912 and built this four-story Georgian Revival Flatiron Building. Akela Cook built a brush manufacturing business in Rhode Island in the early 1800s, which his son Ira took control of after returning from the Civil War. After his father died, Ira sold the business and, and moved west to build a real estate empire in a young Chicago. His sons Chester Akela Cook and Raymond C. Cook became trustees of their father's estate in 1898. In 1923, the Chicago real estate men came to Omaha to build this block-swallowing four-story structure. The Cooks named their mixed-use building, which had been a hotel for long stretches, in honor of their grandfather, and that's why it's known as the Aquila Cork, uh, Court Building. tall building we see in front of us is the old Hill Hotel building. John McDonald began as a working architect in Omaha in 1887, building his reputation as a designer of high-end homes. His son joined the business after graduating from Harvard in 1915, and the McDonald's became the foremost cheerleaders for this colonial revival style in town. This hotel was constructed for John W. and Lim H. Hill in 1919 and is their best commercial work to make it into the 21st century here in the downtown area of Omaha. By 1910, when the Chicago architectural firm of William Holabird and Martin Roche came to an Omaha to give the town its first skyscraper, it had established itself as one of America's leading builders of steel-framed office towers. 
The client for the 220-foot, 16-story tower was City National Bank, and that's the building that we see in front of us today. And the price tag was just a few pennies north of $800,000. Today, it is known as the Orpheum Tower because of a vaudeville house that was added in 1927. It is the descendant of the original Creighton Theater that was funded with money supplied by John A. Creighton in 1895. Creighton was an Ohio man who spent his early years installing telegraph wires across the West. He settled in Omaha in 1868 when he was 37 years old, running a grocery business in Jobbers Canyon at today's Old Market section of town. By the 1890s, Creighton controlled a railroad company and was said to own more good Omaha land than anyone else ever had. He eventually in, uh, endowed, through his wife, a university that bears his name, Creighton University, that's just a little bit here outside the Omaha area. The Regis Hotel building that we see was a major player in downtown Omaha from its inception in 1918 until it closed in the 1970s. The Riddick Tower is one of the town's best Art Deco structures and is the handiwork of Omaha architect Joseph G. MacArthur. This 11-story commercial tower boasts such hallmarks as the form of the form as setbacks, draw a very strong emphasis on verticality of the building as well as decorative terracotta. It is built on ancestral Riddick family land who were pioneers of Omaha and now functions as an upscale hotel. Our last stop on our tour of downtown Omaha takes us into the Old Market District. The Old Market District it's a vi is a vibrant neighborhood that's bordered by South 10th Street to the east and 13th Street to the west. The area is renowned for its numerous restaurants, art galleries, as well as upscale shopping options. It retains the charm of its turn of the 20th century uh, origins with brick paved streets. Sometimes you'll see horse drawn carriages, covered sidewalks, and many times, uh, depending on the time of day or the uh, day of the week, you can encounter street performers, artists, various vendors, and there's just a lively atmosphere here in the old market district. Many of the buildings within the Old Market area have served a variety of purposes and were constructed during different eras, but most of these buildings were constructed from the mid-1800s and, and up through about the early 1900s. Some of the more historic buildings along this area are the Eiler Block Building, which was constructed in 1901, which was originally a six-story warehouse and converted into retail and office space when this entire area was rehabilitated in the 1990s. There's also the Windsor Hotel, which is a three-story brick building, which was constructed in 1885. And several other buildings including the Morse Co. Shoe Company which was a warehouse and line industrial building in 1894 that was rehabilitated in the 2000s as well as the George H. Lee building which was constructed in 1903 as a warehouse and office space and remains a notable structure within the district. Again this is just kind of a really fun, vibrant entertainment area with shopping, bars, restaurants, and much more in this downtown area, and very, very crowded at times.
I hope you've enjoyed this Wondering Walks of Wonder tour here in historic downtown Omaha. If you're a resident of Omaha, leave a comment on what some of your most famous buildings are or some stories that you'd like to share. Also, if there's things that I've missed, let me know so that the next time I'm in Omaha, I can make sure to film those. Also, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, and we will see you on our next Wondering Walks of Wonder adventure. Take care now. Bye-bye.